Book 4. The Red Haired King and His Lady. By Valles and sharp ravines in Lake Damon, the travelers drove to Menelao's mansion and found him at a double wedding feast for son and daughter. Long ago at Troy, he pledged her to the heir of great Achilles, breaker of men, a match the gods had ripened, so he must send her with a chariot train to the town and glory of the Myrmidons. And that day, too, he brought Elector's daughter to marry his tall scion, Megapence, born of a slave girl during the long war, for the gods had never after granted Helen a child to bring into the sunlit world after the first, Rose, lipped Hermione, a girl like the pale, gold goddess Aphrodite. Down the great hall in happiness they feasted, neighbors of Menelaos, and his kin, for whom a holy minstrel harped and sang, and two lithe tumblers moved out on the song with spins and handsprings through the company. Now when Telemachus and Nestor's son pulled up their horses at the main gate, one of the king's companions in arms, Etionius, going outside, caught sight of them. He turned and passed through court and hall to tell the master, stepping up close to get his ear. Said he, two men are here, two strangers, Menelaos, but nobly born Achaeans, they appear. What do you say, shall we unhitch their team, or send them on to someone free to receive them? The red-haired captain answered him in anger, You were no idiot before, Etionius, but here you are talking like a child of ten. Could we have made it home again, and Zeus give us no more hard roving? If other men had never fed us, given us lodging? Bring these men to be our guests, unhitch their team. Etionius left the long room like an arrow, calling equerries after him on the run. Outside, they freed the sweating team from harness, stabled the horses, tied them up, and showered bushels of wheat and barley in the feed box, then leaned the chariot pole against the gleaming entry wall of stone and took the guests in. What a brilliant place that mansion of the great prince seemed to them. A glitter everywhere, as though with fiery points of sunlight, lusters of the moon. The young men gazed in joy before they entered into a room of polished tubs to bathe. Maid servants gave them baths, anointed them, held out fresh tunics, cloaked them warm, and soon they took tall thrones beside the son of Atreus. Here a maid tipped out water for their hands from a golden pitcher into a silver bowl, and set a polished table near at hand. The larder mistress with her tray of loaves and savories came, dispensing all her best, and then a carver heaped their platters high with various meats, and put down cups of gold. Now said the red-haired captain, Menelaos, gesturing, welcome, and fall to, in time, when you have supped, we hope to hear your names, forbears and families, in your case, it seems, no anonymities, but lordly men. Lads like yourselves are not base-born. At this, he lifted in his own hands the king's portion, a chine of beef, and set it down before them. Seeing already then, they took their dinner, but when they had feasted well, Telemachus could not keep still, but whispered, his head bent close, so the others might not hear. My dear friend, can you believe your eyes? The murmuring hall, how luminous it is with bronze, gold, amber, silver, and ivory. This is the way the court of Zeus must be, inside, upon Olympos. What a wonder! But splendid Menelaos had overheard him and spoke out on the instant to them both, young friends, no mortal man can vie with Zeus. His home and all his treasures are forever. But as for men, it may well be that few have more than I. How painfully I wandered before I brought it home. Seven years at sea, Kipros, Phoenicia, Egypt, and still farther among the sun, burnt races. I saw the men of Sidon and Arabia and Libya too, where lambs are horned at birth. In every year they have three lambing seasons, so no man, chief or shepherd, ever goes hungry for want of mutton, cheese, or milk, all year at milking time there are fresh ewes. But while I made my fortune on those travels a stranger killed my brother, in cold blood, tricked blind, caught in the web of his deadly queen. What pleasure can I take, then, being lord over these costly things? You must have heard your fathers tell my story, whoever your fathers are, you must know of my life, the anguish I once had, and the great house full of my treasure, left in desolation. How gladly I should live one-third as rich to have my friends back safe at home. My friends who died on Troy's wide seaboard, far from the grazing lands of Argos. But as things are, nothing but grief is left me for those companions. While I sit at home sometimes hot tears come, and I revel in them, or stop before the surfeit makes me shiver. 
And there is one I miss more than the other dead I mourn for, sleep and food alike grow hateful when I think of him. No soldier took on so much, went through so much, as Odysseus. That seems to have been his destiny, and this mine, to feel each day the emptiness of his absence, ignorant, even, whether he lived or died. How his old father and his quiet wife, Penelope, must miss him still. And Telemachus, whom he left as a new, born child. Now hearing these things said, the boy's heart rose in a long pang for his father, and he wept, holding his purple mantle with both hands before his eyes. Menelaos knew him now, and so fell silent with uncertainty whether to let him speak and name his father in his own time, or to inquire and prompt him. And while he pondered, Helen came out of her scented chamber, a moving grace like Artemis, straight as a shaft of gold. Beside her came a drast, to place her armchair, Alcippe, with a rug of downy wool, and Philo, bringing a silver basket, once given by Alcandra, the wife of Polybos, in the treasure city, Thebes of distant Egypt. He gave two silver bathtubs to Menelaos and a pair of tripods, with ten pure gold bars, and she then, made these beautiful gifts to Helen, a golden distaff, and the silver basket. Rimmed in hammered gold, with wheels to run on. So Philo rolled it in to stand beside her, heaped with fine spun stuff, and cradled on it the distaff swathed in dusky violet wool. Reclining in her light chair with its footrest, Helen gazed at her husband and demanded, Menelaos, my lord, have we yet heard our new guests introduce themselves? Shall I dissemble what I feel? No, I must say it. Never, anywhere, have I seen so great a likeness in man or woman, but it is truly strange. This boy must be the son of Odysseus, Telemachus, the child he left at home that year the Achaean host made war on Troy, daring all for the wanton that I was. And the red-haired captain, Menelaos, answered, My dear, I see the likeness as well as you do. Odysseus' hands and feet were like this boy's, his head and hair, and the glinting of his eyes. Not only that, but when I spoke, just now, of Odysseus' years of toil on my behalf and all he had to endure, the boy broke down and wept into his cloak. Now Nestor's son, Pisistratos, spoke up an answer to him, My lord marshal, Menelaos, son of Atreus, this is that hero's son as you surmise, but he is gentle, and would be. Ashamed to clamor for attention before your grace whose words have been so moving to us both. Nestor, lord of Gerenia, sent me with him as guide and escort, he had wished to see you, to be advised by you or assisted somehow. A father far from home means difficulty for an only son, with no one else to help him, so, with Telemachus, his father left the house without defenders. The king with flaming hair now spoke again, his son, in my house. How I love the man, and how he fought through hardship for my sake. I swore I'd cherish him above all others if Zeus, who views the wide world, gave us passage homeward across the sea in the fast ships. I would have settled him in Argos, brought him over with herds and household out of Ithaca, his child, and all his people. I could have cleaned out one of my towns to be his new domain. And so we might have been together often in feasts and entertainments, never parted till the dark mist of death lapped over one of us. But God himself must have been envious, to batter the bruised man, so that he alone should fail in his return. A twinging ache of grief rose up in everyone, and Helen of Argos wept, the daughter of Zeus, Telemachus and Menelaos wept, and tears came to the eyes of Nestor's son, remembering, for his part, Antilochos, whom the son of shining dawn had killed in battle. But thinking of that brother, he broke out, O son of Atreus, when we spoke of you at home, and asked about you, my old father would say you have the clearest mind of all. If it is not too much to ask, then, let us not weep away these hours after supper, I feel we should not, dawn will soon be here. You understand, I would not grudge a man right morning when he comes to death and doom, what else can one bestow on the poor dead? A lock of hair sheared, and a tear let fall. For that matter, I too, lost someone in the war at Troy, my brother, and no mean soldier, whom you must have known, although I never did, Antilochos. He ranked high as a runner and fighting man. The red-haired Captain Menelaos answered, My lad, what you have said is only sensible, and you did well to speak. Yes, that was worthy a wise man and an older man than you are, you speak for all the world like Nestor's son. How easily one can tell the man whose father had true felicity, marrying and begetting. 
And that was true of Nestor, all his days, down to his sleek old age in peace at home, with clever sons, good spearmen into the bargain. Come, we'll shake off this morning mood of ours and think of supper. Let the men at arms rinse our hands again. There will be time for a long talk with Telemachus in the morning. The hero Menelaos' companion in arms, Asphalion, poured water for their hands, and once again they touched the food before them. But now it entered Helen's mind to drop into the wine that they were drinking in anodyne, mild magic of forgetfulness. Whoever drank this mixture in the wine bowl would be incapable of tears that day, though he should lose mother and father both, or see, with his own eyes, a son or brother mauled by weapons of bronze at his own gate. The opiate of Zeus's daughter bore this canny power. It had been supplied her by Polydamna, mistress of Lord Thon, in Egypt, where the rich plantations grow herbs of all kinds, maleficent and healthful, and no one else knows medicine as they do, Egyptian heirs of Pan, the healing god. She drugged the wine then, had it served, and said, taking again her part in the conversation, O Menelaos, Atreus' royal son, and you that are great heroes' sons, you know how Zeus gives all of us in turn good luck and bad luck, being all-powerful. So take refreshment, take your ease in hall, and cheer the time with stories. I'll begin. Not that I think of naming, far less telling, every feat of that rugged man, Odysseus, but here is something that he dared to do at Troy, where you Achaeans endured the war. He had, first, given himself an outrageous beating and thrown some rags on, like a household slave, then slipped into that city of wide lanes among his enemies. So changed, he looked as never before upon the Achaean beachhead, but like a beggar, merged in the townspeople, and no one there remarked him. But I knew him, even as he was, I knew him, and questioned him. How shrewdly he put me off! But in the end I bathed him, and anointed him, put a fresh cloak around him, and swore an oath not to give him away as Odysseus to the Trojans, till he got back to camp where the long ships lay. He spoke up then, and told me all about the Achaeans, and their plans, then soared many Trojans through the body on his way out with what he learned of theirs. The Trojan women raised a cry, but my heart sang, for I had come round, long before, to dreams of sailing home, and I repented the mad day Aphrodite drew me away from my dear fatherland, forsaking all, child, bridal bed, and husband, a man without defect in form or mind. Replied the red-haired captain, Menelaos, an excellent tale, my dear, and most becoming. In my life I have met, in many countries, foresight and wit in many first-rate men, but never have I seen one like Odysseus for steadiness and a stout heart. Here, for instance, is what he did, had the cold nerve to do, inside the hollow horse, where we were waiting, picked men all of us, for the Trojan slaughter, when all of a sudden, you came by, I dare say drawn by some superhuman power that planned an exploit for the Trojans, and Diphobos, that handsome man, came with you. Three times you walked around it, patting it everywhere, and called by name the flower of our fighters, making your voice sound like their wives, calling. Diomedes and I crouched in the center along with Odysseus, we could hear you plainly, and listening, we too were swept by waves of longing, to reply or go. Odysseus fought us down, despite our craving, and all the Achaeans kept their lips shut tight, all but Anticlos. Desire moved his throat to hail you, but Odysseus' great hands clamped over his jaws and held. So he saved us all, till Pallas Athena led you away at last. Then clear-headed Telemachus addressed him, My lord marshal, Menelaos, son of Atreus, all the more pity, since these valors could not defend him from annihilation, not if his heart were iron in his breast. But will you not dismiss us for the night now? Sweet sleep will be a pleasure, drifting over us. He said no more, but Helen called the maids and sent them to make beds, with purple rugs piled up, and sheets outspread, and fleecy coverlets, in the porch inside the gate. The girls went out with torches in their hands, and presently a squire led the guests, Telemachus and Nestor's radiant son, under the entrance colonnade, to bed. Then deep in the great mansion, in his chamber, Menelaos went to rest, and Helen, queenly in her long gown, lay beside him. When the young dawn with fingertips of rose made heaven bright, the deep, lunged man of battle stood up, pulled on his tunic and his mantle, slung on a sword belt and a new-edged sword, tied his smooth feet into fine rawhide sandals and left his room, a god's brilliance upon him. He sat down by Telemachus, asking gently, Telemachus, 
Why did you come, sir, riding the seas broad back to reach old Lake Damon? A public errand or private? Why, precisely? Telemachus replied, My lord Marshal Menelaos, son of Atreus, I came to hear what news you had of father. My house, my good estates are being ruined. Each day my mother's bullying suitors come to slaughter flocks of mine, and my black cattle, enemies crowd our home. And this is why I come to you for news of him who owned it. Tell me of his death, sir, if perhaps you witnessed it, or have heard some wanderer tell the tale. The man was born for trouble. Spare me no part for kindness sake, be harsh, but put the scene before me as you saw it. If ever Odysseus my noble father served you by promise kept or work accomplished in the land of Troy, where you Achaeans suffered, recall those things for me the way they were. Stirred now to anger, Menelao said, intolerable, that soft men, as those are, should think to lie in that great captain's bed. Fawns in a lion's lair. As if a doe put down her litter of sucklings there, while she quested a glen or cropped some grassy hollow. Ha! Then the Lord returns to his own bed and deals out wretched doom on both alike. So will Odysseus deal out doom on these? O Father Zeus, Athena, and Apollo! I pray he comes as once he was, in Lesbos, when he stood up to wrestle Philomeliades, champion and island king, and smashed him down. How the Achaeans cheered! If only that Odysseus met the suitors, they'd have their consummation, a cold bed. Now for your questions, let me come to the point. I would not misreport it for you, let me tell you what the Ancient of the Sea, who is infallible, said to me, every word. During my first try at a passage homeward the gods detained me, tied me down to Egypt, for I had been too scant in hecatombs, and gods will have the rules each time remembered. There is an island washed by the open sea lying off Nile mouth, seamen call it Pharos, distant a day's sail in a clean hull with a brisk land breeze behind. It has a harbor, a sheltered bay, where shipmasters take on dark water for the outward voyage. Here the gods held me twenty days becalmed. No winds came up, seaward escorting winds for ships that ride the seas broad back, and so my stores and men were used up, we were failing had not one goddess intervened in pity, Idathea, daughter of Proteus, the ancient of the sea. How I distressed her! I had been walking out alone that day, my sailors, thin, bellied from the long fast, were off with fish hooks, angling on the shore, then she appeared to me, and her voice sang, What fool is here, what drooping dunce of dreams? Or can it be, friend, that you love to suffer? How can you linger on this island, aimless and shiftless, while your people waste away? To this I quickly answered, Let me tell you, goddess, whatever goddess you may be, these doldrums are no will of mine. I take it the gods who own broad heaven are offended. Why don't you tell me, since the gods know everything, who has me pinned down here? How am I going to make my voyage home? Now she replied in her immortal beauty, I'll put it for you clearly as may be, friend. The ancient of the salt sea haunts this place, immortal Proteus of Egypt, all the deeps are known to him, he serves under Poseidon and is, they say, my father. If you could take him by surprise and hold him, he'd give you course and distance for your sailing homeward across the cold fish, breeding sea. And should you wish it, noble friend, he'd tell you all that occurred at home, both good and evil, while you were gone so long and hard a journey. To this I said, but you now, you must tell me how I can trap this venerable sea, God. He will elude me if he takes alarm, no man, God knows, can quell a God with ease. That fairest of unearthly nymphs replied, I'll tell you this too, clearly as may be. When the sun hangs at high noon in heaven, the ancient glides ashore under the west wind, hidden by shivering glooms on the clear water, and rests in caverns hollowed by the sea. Their flippered seals, brine children, shining come from silvery foam and crowds, to lie around him, exhaling rankness from the deep sea floor. Tomorrow dawn I'll take you to those caves and bed you down there. Choose three officers for company, brave men they had better be, the old one has strange powers, I must tell you. He goes amid the seals to check their number, and when he sees them all, and counts them all, he lies down like a shepherd with his flock. Here is your opportunity, at this point gather yourselves, with all your heart and strength, and tackle him before he bursts away. He'll make you fight, for he can take the forms of all the beasts, and water, and blinding fire, but you must hold on, 
even so, and crush him until he breaks the silence. When he does, he will be in that shape you saw asleep. Relax your grip, then, set the ancient free, and put your questions, hero, who is the god so hostile to you, and how will you go home on the fish, cold sea? At this she dove under a swell and left me. Back to the ships in the sandy cove I went, my heart within me like a high surf running, but there I joined my men once more at supper, as the sacred night came on, and slept at last beside the lapping water. When dawn spread out her finger tips of rose I started, by the sea's wide level ways, praying the gods for help, and took along three lads I counted on in any fight. Meanwhile the Nereid swam from the lap of ocean laden with four sealskins, new flayed for the hoax she thought of playing on her father. In the sand she scooped out hollows for our bodies and sat down, waiting. We came close to touch her, and, betting us, she threw the sealskins over us, a strong disguise, oh, yes, terribly strong as I recall the stench of those damned seals. Would any man lie snug with a sea monster? But here the nymph, again, came to our rescue, dabbing ambrosia under each man's nose, a perfume drowning out the bestial. Odor. So there we lay with beating hearts all morning while seals came shoreward out of ripples, jostling to take their places, flopping on the sand. At noon the ancient issued from the sea and held inspection, counting off the sea, beasts. We were the first he numbered, he went by, detecting nothing. When at last he slept we gave a battle cry and plunged for him, locking our hands behind him. But the old one's tricks were not knocked out of him, far from it. First he took on a whiskered lion's shape, a serpent then, a leopard, a great boar, then sousing water, then a tall green tree. Still we hung on, by hook or crook, through everything, until the ancient saw defeat, and grimly opened his lips to ask me, son of Atreus, who counseled you to this? A god, what god? Set a trap for me, overpower me, why? He bit it off, then, and I answered, old one, you know the reason, why feign not to know? High and dry so long upon this island I'm at my wit's end, and my heart is sore. You gods know everything, now you can tell me, which of the immortals chained me here? And how will I get home on the fish, cold sea? He made reply at once, you should. Have paid honor to Zeus and the other gods, performing a proper sacrifice before embarking, that was your short way home on the wine-dark sea. You may not see your friends, your own fine house, or enter your own land again, unless you first remount the Nile in flood and pay your hecatomb to the gods of heaven. Then, and then only, the gods will grant the passage you desire. Ah, how my heart sank, hearing this, hearing him send me back on the cloudy sea in my own track, the long hard way of Egypt. Nevertheless, I answered him and said, Ancient, I shall do all as you command. But tell me now the others, had they a safe return? all those Achaeans who stayed behind when Nestor and I left Troy? Or were there any lost at sea, what bitterness? Any who died in camp, after the war? To this he said, for you to know these things goes beyond all necessity, Menelaos. Why must you ask? You should not know my mind, and you will grieve to learn it, I can tell you. Many there were who died, many remain, but two high officers alone were lost, on the passage home, I mean, you saw the war. One is alive, a castaway at sea, the other, Aias, perished with all hands, though first Poseidon landed him on Gyri Promontory, and saved him from the ocean. Despite Athena's hate, he had lived on, but the great sinner in his insolence yelled that the gods will, and the sea were beaten, and this loud brag came to Poseidon's ears. He swung the trident in his massive hands, and in one shock from top to bottom split that promontory, toppling into the sea the fragment where the great fool sat. So the vast ocean had its will with AIAs, drunk in the end on salt spume as he drowned. Meanwhile your brother left the doom astern in his decked ships, the Lady Hera saved him, but as he came round Malia a fresh squall caught him, bearing him away over the cold sea, groaning in disgust, to the land's end of Argos, where Thyestes lived in the days of old, and then his son, Aegisthos. Now, again, return seemed easy, the high gods wound the wind into the east, and back he sailed, this time to his own coast. He went ashore and kissed the earth in joy, hot tears blinding his eyes at sight of home. But there were eyes that watched him from a height, a lookout, paid two bars of gold to keep vigil the year round for Aegisthos' sake, that he should be forewarned and Agamemnon's furious valor sleep unroused. 
Now this man with his news ran to the tyrant, who made his crooked arrangements in a flash, stationed picked men at arms, a score of men in hiding, set a feast in the next room, then he went out with chariots and horses to hail the king and welcome him to evil. He led him into banquet, all serene, and killed him, like an ox felled at the trough, and not a man of either company survived that ambush in Igisto's house. Before the end my heart was broken down. I slumped on the trampled sand and cried aloud, caring no more for life or the light of day, and rolled their weeping, till my tears were spent. Then the unerring ancient said at last, No more, no more, how long must you persist? Nothing is gained by grieving so. How soon can you return to Argos? You may take him alive there still, or else meanwhile Orestes will have dispatched him. You'll attend the feast. At this my heart revived, and I recovered the self-command to question him once more, of two companions now I know. The third? Tell me his name, the one marooned at sea, living, you say, or dead? Even in pain I wish to hear. And this is all he answered, Laertes' son, whose home is Ithaca. I saw him weeping, weeping on an island. The nymph Calypso has him, in her hall. No means of faring home are left him now, no ship with oars, and no ship's company to pull him on the broad back of the sea. As to your own destiny, Prince Menelaos, you shall not die in the bluegrass land of Argos, rather the gods intend you for elision with golden Rhodomanthos at the world's end, where all existence is a dream of ease. Snowfall is never known there, neither long frost of winter, nor torrential rain, but only mild and lulling airs from ocean bearing refreshment for the souls of men, the west wind always blowing. For the gods hold you, as Helen's lord, a son of Zeus. At this he dove under a swell and left me, and I went back to the ship with my companions, feeling my heart's blood in me running high, but in the long hull's shadow, near the sea, we supped again as sacred night came on and slept at last beside the lapping water. When dawn spread out her fingertips of rose, in first light we launched on the courtly breakers, setting up masts and yards in the well, found ships, went all on board, and braced on planks athwart oarsmen in line dipped oars in the grey sea. Soon I drew into the great stream fed by heaven and, laying by, slew bulls in the proper number, until the immortal gods were thus appeased, then heaped a death mound on that shore against all, quenching time for Agamemnon's honor, and put to sea once more. The gods sent down a stern wind for a racing passage homeward. So ends the story. Now you must stay with me and be my guest eleven or twelve days more. I'll send you on your way with gifts, and fine ones, three chariot horses, and a polished car, a hammered cup too, so that all your days, tipping the red wine for the deathless gods, you will remember me. Telemachus answered, Lord, son of Atreus, no, you must not keep me. Not that a year with you would be too long, I never could be homesick here, I find your tales and all you say so marvelous. But time hangs heavy on my shipmates' hands at Holy Pilus, if you make me stay. As for your gift, now, let it be some keepsake. Horses I cannot take to Ithaca, let me bestow them back on you, to serve your glory here. My lord, you rule wide country, rolling and rich with clover, galingale, and all the grains, red wheat, and hoary barley. Home we have no level runs or meadows, but highland, goat land, prettier than plains though. Grasses and pasture land are hard to come by upon the islands tilted in the sea, and Ithaca is the island of them all. At this the deep, lunged man of battle smiled. Then he said kindly, patting the boy's hand, You come of good stock, lad. That was well spoken. I'll change the gift, then, as indeed I can. Let me see what is costliest and most beautiful of all the precious things my house contains, a wine bowl, mixing bowl, all wrought of silver, but rimmed with hammered gold. Let this be yours. It is Hephaestus' work, given me by Phidemos, captain and king of Sidon. He received me during my travels. Let it be yours, I say. This was their discourse on that morning. Meanwhile guests were arriving at the great lord's house, bringing their sheep and wine, the ease of men, with loaves their comely kerchiefed women sent, to make a feast in hall. At that same hour, before the distant manor of Odysseus, the suitors were competing at the discus throw and javelin, on a measured field they used, arrogant lords at play. The two best men, Antinous and Eurymachos, presided. 
Now Fronio's son, Noman, came to see them with a question for Antinous. He said, Do any of us know, or not, Antinous, what day Telemachus will be home from Pylos? He took my ship, but now I need it back to make a cruise to Elis, where the plains are. I have a dozen maras at pasture there with mule colts yet unweaned. My notion is to bring one home and break him in for labor. His first words made them stare, for they knew well Telemachus could not have gone to Pylos, but inland with his flocks, or to the swineherd. You paid son, Antinous, quickly answered, tell the story straight. He sailed. Who joined him, a crew he picked up here in Ithaca, or his own slaves? He might have done it that way. And will you make it clear whether he took the ship against your will? Did he ask for it, did you lend it to him? Now said the son of Phronios in reply, lent it to him, and freely. Who would not, when a prince of that house asked for it, in trouble? Hard to refuse the favor, it seems to me. As for his crew, the best men on the island, after ourselves, went with him. Mentor I noted going aboard, or a god who looked like Mentor. The strange thing is, I saw Lord Mentor here in the first light yesterday, although he sailed five days ago for Pylos. Turning away, Noman took the path to his father's house, leaving the two men there, bath-led and hostile. They called the rest in from the playing field and made them all sit down, so that Antinous could speak out from the storm cloud of his heart, swollen with anger, and his eyes. Blazed, a bad business. Telemachus had the gall to make that crossing, though we said he could not. So the young cub rounds up a first-rate crew in spite of all our crowd, and puts to sea. What devilment will he be up to next time? Zeus blasts the life out of him before he's grown. Just give me a fast ship and twenty men. I'll intercept him, board him in the strait between the crags of Same and this island. He'll FND his sea adventure after his father's swamping work in the end. They all cried I. And after him. And trailed back to the manor. Now not much time went by before Penelope learned what was afoot among the suitors. Medin the crier told her. He had been outside the wall and heard them in the court conspiring. Into the house and up the stairs he ran to her with his news upon his tongue, but at the door Penelope met him, crying, Why have they sent you up here now? To tell the maids. Of King Odysseus, leave your spinning, time to go down and slave to feed those men? I wish this were the last time they came feasting, courting me or consorting here. The Last Each day you crowd this house like wolves to eat away my brave son's patrimony. When you were boys, did your own fathers tell you nothing of what Odysseus was for them? In word and act impeccable, disinterested toward all the realm, though it is king's justice to hold one man abhorred and love another, no man alive could say Odysseus wronged him. But your own hearts, how different! And your deeds! How soon are benefactions all forgotten! Now Medan, the alert and cool man, answered, I wish that were the worst of it, my lady, but they intend something more terrible, may Zeus forfend and spare us. They plan to drive the keen bronze through Telemachus when he comes home. He sailed away, you know, to hallowed Pylos and old Lake Damon for news about his father. Her knees failed, and her heart failed as she listened to the words, and all her power of speech went out of her. Tears came, but the rich voice could not come. Only after a long while she made answer, why has my child left me? He had no need of those long ships on which men shake out sail to tug like horses, breasting miles of. See. Why did he go? Must he, too, be forgotten? Then Medan, the perceptive man, replied, A god moved him, who knows? Or his own heart sent him to learn, at Pylos, if his father roams the wide world still, or what befell him. He left her then, and went down through the house. And now the pain around her heart benumbed her, chairs were a step away, but far beyond her, she sank down on the door sill of the chamber, wailing, and all her women young and old made a low murmur of lament around her, until at last she broke out through her tears, dearest companions, what has Zeus given me? Pain, more pain than any living woman. My lord, my lion heart, gone, long ago, the bravest man and best, of the Danans, famous through Hellas, and the Argive Midlands, and now the squalls have blown my son, my dear one, an unknown boy, southward. No one told me. 
Oh brute creatures, not one soul would dare to wake me from my sleep. You knew the hour he took the black ship out to sea. If I had seen that sailing in his eyes he should have. Stayed with me, for all his longing, stayed, or left me dead in the great hall. Go, someone, now, and call old Dolios, the slave my father gave me before I came, my orchard keeper, tell him to make haste and put these things before Laertes, he may plan some kind of action, let him come to cry shame on these ruffians who would murder Odysseus' son and heir, and end his line. The dear old nurse, Eurycleia, answered her, sweet mistress, have my throat cut without mercy or what you will, it's true, I won't conceal it, I knew the whole thing, gave him his provisions, grain and sweet wine I gave, and a great oath to tell you nothing till twelve days went by, or till you heard of it yourself, or missed him, he hoped you would not tear your skin lamenting. Come, bathe and dress your loveliness afresh, and go to the upper rooms with all your maids to ask help from Athena, Zeus's daughter. She it will be who saves this boy from death. Spare the old man this further suffering, the blissful gods cannot so hate his line, heirs of Arcesios, one will yet again be lord of the tall house and the far fields. She hushed her weeping in this way, and soothed her. The lady Penelope arose and bathed, dressing her body in her freshest linen, filled a basket with barley, and led her maids to the upper rooms, where she besought Athena, tireless child of Zeus, graciously hear me. If ever Odysseus burned at our altar fire thigh bones of beef or mutton in sacrifice, remember it for my sake. Save my son. Shield him, and make the killers go astray. She ended with a cry, and the goddess heard her. Now voices rose from the shadowy hall below where the suitors were assuring one another, our so, long, courted queen is even now of a mind to marry one of us, and knows nothing of what is destined for her son. Of what was destined they in fact knew nothing, but Antinous addressed them in a whisper, no boasting, are you mad? And no loud talk, someone might hear it and alarm the house. Come along now, be quiet, this way, come, we'll carry out the plan our hearts are set on. Picking out twenty of the strongest seamen, he led them to a ship at the sea's edge, and down they dragged her into deeper water, stepping a mast in her, with furled sails. An oars a, trail from thongs looped over thole pins, ready all, then tried the white sail, hoisting, while men at arms carried their gear aboard. They moored the ship some way offshore, and left her to take their evening meal there, waiting for night to come. Penelope at that hour in her high chamber lay silent, tasting neither food nor drink, and thought of nothing but her princely son, could he escape, or would they find and kill him? Her mind turning at bay, like a cornered lion in whom fear comes as hunters close the ring. But in her sick thoughts sweet sleep overtook her, and she dozed off, her body slack and still. Now it occurred to the grey, I goddess Athena to make a figure of dream in a woman's form, if thyme, great Icario's other daughter, whom Eumelos of Pharae took as bride. Bride. The goddess sent this dream to Odysseus' house to quiet Penelope and end her grieving. So, passing by the strap, slid through the door, the image came a, gliding down the room to stand at her bedside and murmur to her, Sleepest thou, sorrowing Penelope? The gods whose life is ease no longer suffer thee to pine and weep, then, he returns unharmed, thy little one, no way hath he offended. Then pensive Penelope made this reply, slumbering sweetly in the gates of dream, Sister, hast thou come hither? Why? Aforetime never wouldst come, so far away thy dwelling. And am I bid be done with all my grieving? But see what anguish hath my heart and soul. My lord, my lion heart, gone, long ago, the bravest man and best, of the Danans, famous through Hellas, and the Argive Midlands, and now my son, my dear one, gone seafaring, a child, untrained in hardship or in counsel. I, tis for him I weep more than his father. I, how I tremble for him, lest some blow befall him at men's hands or on the sea. Cruel are they and many who plot against him to take his life before he can return. Now the dim phantom spoke to her once more, lift up thy heart and fear not overmuch. For by his side one goes whom all men else invoke as their defender, one so powerful, Pallas Athena, in thy tears she pitied thee, and now hath sent me that I so assure thee. Then said Penelope the wise, if thou art numinous and hast ears for divine speech, O tell me, what of Odysseus, man of woe? Is he alive still somewhere, seeth he daylight still? Or gone in death to the sunless underworld? 
The dim phantom said only this in answer, of him I may not tell thee in this discourse, alive or dead. And empty words are evil. The wavering form withdrew along the doorbolt into a draught of wind, and out of sleep Penelope awoke, in better heart for that clear dream in the twilight of the night. Meanwhile the suitors had got under way, planning the death plunge for Telemachus. Between the Isles of Ithaca and Same the sea is broken by an islet, Asterisk, with access to both channels from a cove. In ambush here that night the Achaeans lay.